Hey, everybody. Welcome to the Entrepreneur Motivation Podcast. I'm your host, Chris Bello. And today I've got Chris Mansky on the show. Chris, welcome. Hey, good to see you. Good to see you as well. And just your bio real quick for our audience. Over his long investing career, Christopher, or Chris Mansky, has helped many financial insiders, including Wall Street analysts, retiring investment advisors, and federal judges. A United States Military Academy graduate, Mansky has been praised, published, or quoted in the Wall Street Journal, Reader's Digest, U.S. News and World Report, Forbes, and more. As a successful money manager and frequent media guest, his thoughts can be seen online at Yahoo Finance, MSN.com, CEO World, and Strategic Finance. Mansky was a keynote speaker for the AARP and has worked with leaders at companies such as Microsoft, Exxon, IBM, and many more. Very cool portfolio. I love the bio and it gives us a good insight into who you are, Chris. So welcome once again. Yeah, thanks a lot. I'm looking forward to our conversation. Likewise. So we're going to be talking about just preparation and investing. Obviously, you have a book book out, The Prepared Investor. Has it been published already or is, are you doing the pre-launch, you said? Uh, the launch happened on October 20th. The publisher okay. uh, had wanted to get it out in September, but I think COVID and everything delayed it a little bit. And Right. Uh, yeah, it's been really well received. There's a number of really positive reviews on Amazon, which you know, for a guy sitting in Texas, it's weird to see strangers from other parts of the world <laughs> saying good things about your book. So I'm really flattered. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. I mean, the world is such a small place now with technology and Amazon just connecting everyone to see people, for example, that listen to the show from Africa or London or Australia. And I'm here in Houston, Texas as well. So it just blows my mind. But let, let's talk about, I guess, first, how did you get to where you are now? Was this always a career path? I'm always interested to learn, like, did you know you wanted to do what you're doing now? Or did you kind of work in finance before? How did you kind of get it to, work, to where you are now? Well, uh, so I've got 20 plus years in finance, all of it as an investment advisor or leading training advisors. Uh, before that, I was an officer in the Army. Uh, and I did my undergraduate work at the United States Military Academy at West Point. So I was, uh, I knew I was going to go into the army. I think uh, the, the idea of me being an investment advisor didn't really surface until one of my friends uh, from the service, uh, had shared with me that when he got out of the military, he really enjoyed his time with Merrill Lynch. And so I looked into that along with a number of other career paths. And I think without his guidance, it never would have happened. Wow. Very interesting to see how people can have such a big influence in your life. So obviously you are the average of the five people you surround yourself with. It's very important to surround yourself with people and places you'd like to be because they will pull you in many cases with them, whether that's good or bad. So just a little tidbit for the audience, of course, surround yourself with people who will pull you into places you'd like to be. So now that you're in this area, you work with a lot of larger clients. I'm assuming many of your clients work at some of the things that we listed, ExxonMobil, for example, IBM, Microsoft. Is that still the case or have you kind of diversified in terms of who you work with lately? Well, uh, so the team here, we are listed in the Houston Business Journal as one of the larger investment houses in all of Houston. And we are consistently listed on the national register of the largest investment firms. And I don't think you can get to that size by you know, just working with a single type of customer. You know, we've got a number of advisors here and each one has a, a target market that's their specialty. So as an example, we have one advisor, her focus is the consulting industry. So if you're going to be a partner or you've been a partner for some time with, you know, any of the, the big consulting firms, KPMG, Ernst & Young, you know, Accenture, we've got a few consultants that they left their consulting work to go into industry. And uh, we just really get along with those, you know, those, those mentalities. But in addition to that, you've got uh, another advisor here who focuses on retirement plans for business owners. Another uh, of the advisors here focuses specifically on oil and gas engineers and executives. So you can see it, you know, each advisor has their niche. And when you combine it all together, you know, we end up uh, serving individuals and institutions all over the globe. Yeah, that's very interesting. I'm always just curious to learn because I know a lot of people listening to the show come from different backgrounds, different businesses, and uh, just how we set up our organizations and make sure to stay productive and focused. So I love how everything's niched down in a way where everyone's got their specialty, but at the same time, it allows you to come together and just have that growth 
where you are such a large investment um, firm. So very cool. Well, I'd love to talk a little bit more about becoming a prepared investor. This is a topic, you know, many people with all the stocks and the the craziness going on. I've seen, you know, Robinhood app and everyone buying GameStop, all kinds of crazy things going on in the world today. So what should someone do to become a prepared investor? Well, I think that it's not an easy answer when you really want to go from, you know, zero to 60. But I think just to even get all that started, you have to at least get in the car and start it up before you can even hope to go zero to 60. Right. And that, that I feel like is education. You know, I think that that first step is education. And obviously my book is, in my opinion, is a great place to start. But you know, maybe the first step doesn't even have to be a book like mine. It could just be changing your routine a little bit to plug in slightly more to multiple points of view. One of the topics that I touch on in the book is that it's kind of natural and normal these days that people are getting news in a way that is comfortable for them. It's coming from a bias that they're maybe sharing with the news source. But if you if you consider coupling your news, where for every source that you kind of naturally gravitated to, try to find a source that you are uncomfortable with, that you don't like that much, couple them together and see what both of them are saying about current events. That's a great start. You know, you really start to see the nuance behind the the jargon. You get to see the complexity behind the just simple good or bad, you know, from, uh, from the different media outlets. Definitely. So I love that. I love that example. And I always love to ask people for books they recommend, especially subject matter experts in a certain field. What are one or two books? And then that way you can actually have a starting point to get some basic foundational knowledge before you get into that, because we all do want to go zero to 60. We're all guilty of that, but we have to go get in the car first, put on the seatbelt, start, you know, a driver's ed doing 10 miles an hour in a parking lot. And then we gain the experience and knowledge to actually know what to look for. So do you have any sources that you would mind sharing in terms of who do you follow? And I know it obviously depends on who do we actually like to follow. Anything would be helpful, I believe, for our audience just to have an idea of who you kind of go to for your information and any news sources or anything like that would be super helpful to hear. Oh, gosh. Yeah. Thanks for asking. I'm glad to share. In fact, I'll probably expand your question to not just news sources, but I think also habits matter. So, yes. you know, whether the, whether somebody's listening to this and they're saying, oh, Chris Mansky gets his news from this source, so that's who I want to do it. But maybe it's even more powerful to think about when in your day, how do you get it? And, uh, and so just to share some of those thoughts, and then I'm happy to share sources as well. I, I've really enjoyed fitting in listening to the news. You know, it's so fun to wear my headphones or to be alone in the car and to, to get the information in a way that allows me to do other things at the same time. So, you know, the, the, everyone's going to have those parts of their day. Maybe they have a, a driving routine or they have a, a kind of like a, a typical lunch appointment by themselves with their, you know, peanut butter and jelly, or, you know, they uh, uh, they have an exercise time that, you know, they can listen to a great podcast or a good you know, a good news report. All of those, I think, are, are real sharp ways to get the news. But then in addition to that, news, I think often we feel like that means something that is less than 24 hours old, but sometimes you can get excellent insight from a well-researched nonfiction book. And so adding into your life reading, or I mean, at the bare minimum, listening to the audiobooks, but reading a book, you know, there's a lot of research that shows that with just 15 to 30 minutes of reading a day, it can truly alter not just your knowledge, it can alter your perception, it can change your trajectory with success. I mean, I really hope that folks that listen to your podcast, that if there's one thing they get out of this is the power of you know, trying to double up. You know, I'm not just driving to work, I'm also listening to the news, or I'm not just doing my jog I'm also listening to a really informative podcast, or I'm not just eating a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. I'm also reading that uh, memoir by the former president or, you know, things like that. It really goes a long way. Definitely. Uh, 
I actually wanted to chime in there too. I just had a podcast listener message me on Instagram today and I always update my stories with updates of what I'm doing, books that I'm reading. And he mentioned, it, it seems like like you read a lot or you read really fast. Do you have any tips for speed reading? And I replied, I'm actually not a very fast reader. I just read 25 to 30 minutes every day. And I'm surprised consistently of how many books I read a year. I actually track the number of pages I read. I think last year I read like 7,500 pages or something like that. Congrats. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. So every morning it's part of the routine, but that goes to show based, you know, what you were just talking about consistency, making the time to read. You don't have to speed read. You don't have to know all these different tips and tricks. You just have to do it and plan for it every single day and you'll yeah. absorb so much information and then doubling up. That's another huge one that I love to do. And I recommend is just, if you're about to sit down and eat for 20 minutes and there's nothing really going on, don't just watch whatever's on TV, put a, put on something that you're interested in learning and you can actually learn while you're driving or eating or on the treadmill or whatever. I'm with you hundred percent. Well, as far as where I get information, I'll look at, uh, uh, the Wall Street Journal and the New York Times. So those, I think, are a great uh, pair. One's conservative and one isn't. And you really get to see two sides of the story. And that probably for most listeners, that's enough. Uh, but uh, a couple other uh, wonderful sources of information that I, I just can't help but share. One is uh, the the Lex Freakin podcast. I'm sure you've, you've heard it. Um, man, he is a smart guy with some great guests. Sometimes it's only entertainment. But mm -hmm. many times it touches on topics, topics of policy and technology, and you can you can really hear the host's uh, happiness of you know sharing something good with the listeners. In which case, you know, actually that makes me think of you too. You know, you, you the way you started your podcast before we began recording, I could really tell that you know this is not just a, a drudge for you; it's a real happy thing. Thank and, you. Uh, yes, yes. And when you're engaging in those things that you love to do, I mean, you can tell when a host is actually interested in the topic and right. chances are they wouldn't be doing the show still if it wasn't interesting to them in some way or maybe supporting their business, at least financially in some way. So uh, uh, thank you for pointing that out because yes, this is, I do real estate full time, for example, but the podcast and connecting with people such as yourself and learning while teaching the audience something, they get to be a fly on the wall on this conversation there's so much power in just sharing that. And so I think it's just that generosity, you know, what goes around comes around. So we're talking here today, someone in the audience may invest in your book and then learn something and become an investor. And five years from now, they're donating to huge charities and it all comes back. So very good yeah. advice here that we're talking about today. Yeah. The ripple effect. The ripple you know, you're effect making me real. think of a book that I'm sure you've read it before, uh, but I, I just was introduced to it and I really enjoyed it uh, called The Art uh, sorry, called The War of Art. I have read, was that the Stephen Pressfield one? Yes. yes. Yeah, It's he's a former Marine and he's such an amazing historian. They made him a citizen of Greece, an honorary citizen of Greece. He's, uh, he's a great writer and The War of Art for people who would like to get some motivation. Yeah. That's a great wow. one. What a good one. And I know there's the art of war, but then the war of art is that one. I think it had like a flower and just a blank white cover. I can't remember exactly, but it was a very good book in terms of thinking differently and just understanding that putting art out there, putting whatever your craft is out there, that is like a form of stress relief in a way and just being yourself, your true authentic self, and you'll figure things out as you go. And I'm sure a lot of that is in your book as well. A lot of your blood, sweat, and tears, and your experience, you put it all into that book as well. So books are huge for tapping into the knowledge that someone has. Your your lifetime of experience in a in a book that's you know a couple hundred pages long, most likely you can read it in a couple of days or weeks if you really wanted to and get a good foundation before really diving in on a subject. So yeah. thank you for sharing those resources. At times, it's it's almost the quality of the resources more than what they talk about that matters because if you know you can trust that information and that it's going to be timely and relevant, that is a lot better than just listening to, you know, maybe the first thing that pops up on a Google search, for example. Yeah, I hear what you mean. I was really surprised by a book uh, called Brain on Fire. Brain I on thought, Fire. Yeah, I had thought that it was going to be about 
how we can get more out of our you know mental capacity and trick you know tricks to be organized that, that's what i thought it was but it turned out to be a really hard hitting uh, investigative memoir about a short period of time when a, a woman uh, an investigative reporter with the New York Post when she went insane, temporarily insane for about four months or so. And uh, she narrowly missed a cure to this really serious disease and ended up uh, uh, luckily finding, you know, finding a doctor that could diagnose her properly. But everyone just wanted to put her into a mental institution when uh, just the opposite. And so it, it was a, a real touching story about just how fragile we are and how much we should remember to take our health uh, with uh, with a dose of gratitude and you know even just moments like this you know you and I haven't shaken hands but I really feel grateful to meet you and to know you and you know the, these uh, these are special times when you can communicate with others and you can hear the thoughts of people that you respect because there are a lot of people out there that don't have that freedom that don't have that ability just maybe because of their health or because of the country they live in. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. It's the little things that go a long way. So I wrote that down brain on fire. That's very interesting. And I, I was watching another random movie. I can't remember what, what the name was, but basically someone goes to prison for a murder and she didn't do it. And the husband breaks her out or something. It, it was a interesting movie, but I guess I don't want to spoil it, but in any case, it made me think of that in a way where, life can change for you in a matter of a few days, things can be great and something could happen financially or, you know, with your job, you know, jobs aren't really super secure in some areas, some other areas like real estate where I am, fortunately they're booming. So understanding that things can change so quickly, it's, it's insane to see a year ago before the pandemic really started and everything we're eating at restaurants that all seemed normal and fine and now I don't think any music venues or anything have really had any concerts. Some have done socially distanced stuff. So business has kind of shifted entirely in some industries. So being prepared, whether it's an investor or for your business, or I guess for anything really, at this point, I wouldn't be surprised, you know, if dinosaurs came back and, and aliens <laughs> visited us, but how can we really be prepared? I know you said you gave us a couple of resources is there a great place you recommend for someone who's never invested in any stocks or done anything? Should they put aside a certain amount? Is there a recommendation you make, like a percentage of their income? Um, any advice on that I think would be very helpful for listeners in the audience. Okay. Well, so if you're just starting off, usually we say that and we leave out the most important part of the phraseology because what are we starting off? Are we starting off our career? Are we starting off our marriage? Mm. Are we starting off our family? We're starting off, right? Uh, you know, there, there's something that we're starting off. And so a lot of times when people say that to me, what they're kind of in the back of their minds are thinking, okay, well, Chris is going to talk now about if you've never invested before and you're starting off investing. But I, I like to, to ask, well, what are we starting off? Because you invest for a purpose. You don't invest just because, right. you know, if somebody says, Hey, make me some money. Well, there's a <laughs> lot of ways to do that. Yeah. Are you sure this is the right way? What is the point of this? You know, and there's a, a, a lot of research into, you know, that the idea that money doesn't have a mind of its own, you have the mind and the money helps you to accomplish the things that your mind can create or desire or, you know, uh, or gra you know, gravitate toward. And so the question of, you know, they're just starting off. Well, what are they starting? Because it's a really different answer if you're just starting a career. You know, you're in your early 20s and you're, uh, you're beginning to, you've gotten that second or third promotion and beginning to, to save. And what are you saving for? Well, if you're saving to buy a house, well, you're probably going to be buying a house pretty shortly maybe this isn't a time for you to get into stocks. If you're saving up because you're, you know, you're going to get married and have children and uh, this is all going to happen the next three to five years, well, perhaps saving in the stock market isn't really the, the <laughs> right path for you. Uh, th there are other things that, that make sense and other questions you should be asking, questions about, you know, is this a forever home? You know, how big of a house do I need? How, how far will my commute be? What will the budget be? 
what tools does my spouse bring to this that is going to make our lives together easier? And what roles and responsibilities do the two of us want to have together? And will there be kids? And how many, you know, there's so much there. You're just starting off. And all of that has nothing to do with stocks. But as soon as you're clear that, okay, we've got to accomplish X and we need money for X and I don't want to have to save all of it. I'd like to be smart about, you know, that money working for itself to, to capture that goal. Well, that's probably a great time to talk about investing with uh, someone who that's what they do for a living and they can, you know, point toward, uh, you know, great ways to get it going. My guess is that most of the board certified planners, if you're just starting to, to save in the market, they're going to say a great way to do it is with the, uh, you know, the ETFs, exchange traded funds that are put together by the big companies like Vanguard, where the fees are incredibly low and you capture a lot of the market at once. I mean, it's not guaranteed it'll go up, but I mean, over the long term, these kinds of investments, the risk is you know, lower than owning an individual stock. And the idea that you could come out ahead over the long term is, you know, it's a little bit better. So yeah, that's a good place to start. Great. And I love what you said there about asking questions on what's important to you, because I, I just did a video about this recently. When you know what you want, you start to ask relevant questions. If you don't know what you want, you don't know where you're going. And so when you understand what does my future life look like? Am I married? Do I have kids? Do I not have kids? Do I have one kid? Are they going to college? How much money is that going to cost? Those are the things that actually impact your investments today. You know, the size of the house that you're going to get. It's going to be different if you're a millennial couple that doesn't plan on having any kids versus if you want to have three kids, you're going to get a bigger house. And I see that with my clients as well. They're thinking about where's the baby room going to be? How far is it going to be from the primary bedroom? Those are things that it's easy to overlook, but when you're actually there and you're doing it, if you're, if you're planning correctly, the quality of your questions determine the quality of the answers that you get. So thank you yeah. for pointing that out. I just wanted to highlight that because it's so important to understand what are your goals and maybe stocks aren't the best way to go. If you are about to put a down payment up on a house, you want to have that, that money more liquid perhaps. So yeah, getting very clear. Yeah, you're, uh, you're reminding me that uh, a conversation I had with my publisher, this was just before the holidays, and she had said, uh, you'll never guess who really loves your book. And I said, okay, you're right. Uh, who, who are we talking about? And she says, there's a group called the FIRE Movement, Financial Independent, Retire oh, Early, yeah. Yeah. And, uh, and that they're mostly people between the age of 20 and 30, and they, they really love the book because they're all trying very hard to achieve to that quickly amass, you know, a nest egg that will support them so that they feel independent and that they, if they want to work, they can, but that they're, they're not beholden to, you know, to the grind. Absolutely. And, uh, and so, you know, that's a person, that's an organization, a, you know, that's a mentality that they definitely know what their goal is. You know, they figured it out. Definitely. Definitely. I have a friend who comes to mind, actually a client as well, where he's very much of that mentality. He's got a nice nest egg, you know, buying investment properties, makes very good income every month from a business that he created and grew. And that is something that he had in his profile was fire, you know, financial independence, retire early, because essentially he is doing some things to generate income actively but at the same time, he's more focused on building investments and living off the passive income so that he's not having to work unless he really wants to and he can right. live remotely. And you get a lot more flexibility and freedom that way. But of course, it goes back to what do you want? He wanted that. He planned for it. And now he's reaping the benefits as a result. Right. Yeah, well said. Thank you. Yeah. So I know we're approaching the end of the uh, half hour here that we have set aside for this conversation. Any last key takeaways that you'd love for the audience to have? Maybe someone who's on the fence or not sure where to put some money that they've inherited or come into. Any tips at all that you think would be relevant to leave the audience with? Yeah, sure. The, the vast majority of people who they've come into money, what they do is they spend it. They buy a second home, they pay yep. off debt, you know, they buy another car, a fancy car. Uh, that, you know, it, it's gone. The money is is no longer theirs in its place. They have something that costs them more money. Right. They have, to, they have to insure it or maintain it or whatever. So my my thought would be, uh, and it's actually one of the thoughts in the book, The Prepared Investor, would be to 
hold on to your assets, especially money. Make sure that if you're buying anything after your needs are met, anything that you're buying should be making you money. If it's just costing you more money, really all you're doing is you're keeping up with the Joneses and you're you're right. showing the world that you used to have money. <laughs> <laughs> And now I you have, <laughs> yeah. Now you have this thing that you bought, but now you have a new car, the driveway that you're making payments on, and it's costing right. you every single month. Right. That's very powerful. So you're showing people that you used to have money when you buy those new things. Now you're kind of a slave to it. I see the rat race all the time, right? The uh, the hamster wheel, the lifestyle, keeping up with the Joneses. I think they call oh. it lifestyle creep. You earn a little bit more. Now you're spending more. You're not really growing your net worth at that point. You're just having flashier things, but bigger overhead. And it just, you can't escape it at some point. So invest in things that actually make you money. That is a huge takeaway for sure. Yeah. If you don't mind, I'll throw another one your way. Cause you'd said lifestyle. I, I love free. it. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Uh, so one of the, the comments that has really touched me as people have complimented me about the prepared investor. One of the comments was how uh, life-changing one of the uh, 20 action steps are. And that was to uh, save everything first. So lifestyle creep, people think that lifestyle creep happens because they didn't save uh, extra money. But that is not the cause of lifestyle creep. Lifestyle creep happens because you have extra money from a new promotion, from a bonus, from a deal that closed that was an extra or because of a garage sale or because of you know, whatever it might be, somebody in the family worked overtime, but somehow there's money that came in that's a little bit different and it doesn't get saved. It gets right. spent. So the way you avoid that is everything you make, ever, every dollar that you make, it goes to savings first. And then you control your lifestyle by pulling out of savings what is your actual monthly budget. So let's just use round numbers and, and you know keep it real simple. Say $1,000 is your lifestyle. Of course it's not, but just to keep it simple. Well, over time, you've got promotions that happen. You've got bonuses that happen. And most people, that money kind of slips their fingers. It gets frittered away because of lifestyle creep. Right. But but what you're doing is you've saved everything. The only way you're spending more than your thousand dollars a month is if you consciously choose to go into savings and get it, or if you consciously change your uh, monthly budget to a different number. Let's say you give yourself a raise and now you're doing 1500 a month, whatever. Uh, that happens because you're in control of it, but you're not in control of it when money comes in to your operating account. You yes. you are experiencing lifestyle creep, whether you know it or not. The, the only way to avoid it is uh, that tactic. The, the only way I know of to avoid it is the tactic that I just presented that is explained pretty deeply in my book. Thank you for that. That's a huge tip right there. And I mean, I found myself guilty of that when I had an oil and gas job, you get a $5,000 extra bonus. Oh, I, I could go buy all these things and you know do this and go on that trip and it's gone. And so if you put everything in a savings account first, just to reiterate to the audience, put it in the savings account first and make sure you're still staying consistent with that monthly budget and your savings will continue to grow and compound. I love that. Just yeah, pretend it's a, money you don't have. <laughs> oh yeah, exactly. I had a couple that we we were working together and uh, they we looked back over five years and uh, the husband, he had been promoted during that five years. And the wife, she had earned three separate good size bonuses during that five years. And they felt real confident and comfortable because they were saving this fixed amount every day, you know, call it, set it and forget it. Yes. They were saving this fixed amount through that whole five years. But if they had been doing the way I described, it would have been a completely different scenario. There was a lot of money that came into their life that they weren't really prepared to receive but it was easy to spend. Yeah, it always is. Very yeah. great tip. I, I love that. And I wrote that down. I think I heard Eli talk about this, who again has been on the show before for everyone listening, Elijah Lopez. And he mentioned that same thing, but this was a great reminder to put it all into that account first. And then you can take it out because if you put it into that operating expenses account, 
you're very easily fooled thinking you have more than you do, especially if you haven't set aside money for taxes and things like that for those who are self-employed or have their own business. And so very, very great tip. Thank you so much, Chris. And where can our audience go to connect with you to order a copy of your book? Is there a great central hub or website or social media account they can go to? Uh, If you just Google Chris Mansky or if you Google The Prepared Investor, that's probably the easiest way. I mean, the book's all over the place. Wherever you buy books, uh, you you can get it uh, online. And, you know, my my, my firm is in LinkedIn and, you know, you can find me on Twitter and Facebook. I mean, we we try real hard to be transparent. We try real hard to be approachable. So it should be easy for people to find this. Sounds good. And I'll drop everything in the show notes. I I publish the video on YouTube and I post the podcast on all the platforms. So for anyone listening, if you want to connect and order a copy of The Prepared Investor, check the show notes and I will be sure to link that just to make it very easy. One click to go check out the site. And so Chris, once again, thank you for being on the show. Great connecting. I learned a lot of great tips. I mean, We've heard a lot of this before in, in different nuggets and stuff, but it's great for a reminder, right? Common sense is not always common. I think it goes back to that. And so just having these reminders in your book, we'll dive into all of that as well in more detail. You said there was 20, there's 20 steps in your book. There is 20 different action steps. Awesome. Uh, fair amount of stories that even a, a beginner, absolute beginner could, could get a charge at it. I know there's going to be a ton of value in there. I mean, we got so many just from that one step you t- you touched on here. So thank you once again, Chris. We, I love to grab coffee or something sometime, you know, whenever COVID stuff calms down, I am here in Houston as well. So we'll, we'll be in touch. Sounds great. Thank you. Sounds good. Thank you.